Well, thanks for taking the time. Uh, my name is Tim Looney. I'm the Sen Senior Director of Immunology and Bioinformatics at Singular Genomics. We're a next generation sequencing company. And today I'm going to talk to you about ways in which we've been working to improve next generation sequencing through innovations in chemistry and engineering. So the outline of my talk is as follows. I, I'm gonna start by highlighting the current challenges in NGS, uh, both for research and, and clinical use. And there I'm going to uh, highlight the importance of fast, flexible sequencing to reduce turnaround time. In the, in the second part of my talk, I'm going to switch and, and provide an overview of the sequencing by synthesis process. And along the way, I'll describe uh, the, the innovations we've made to enable rapid SBS. And then in the last portion of this presentation, I'm going, going to describe applications of rapid SBS. And there I'll, I'll provide data from the uh, new Singular Genomics G4 platform. So to get things started, uh, you, you know, before we decided to build the G4 platform, we, we wanted to understand the, the current pain points in NGS and specifically the, the factors contributing to long turnaround time. And, and so we, we talked to a number of NGS users, both in the clinical and research space, and asked them about things uh, such as the time required for library preparation, delays owing to the batching of samples, the time spent on sequencing itself, and then in the case of the clinical applications, the time spent on analysis and interpretation. And the results of that study uh, is presented in this slide. So at the top, for clinical applications where the turnaround time is roughly one to two weeks, we found that batching-related delays and the time for sequencing itself were the primary contributors to the turnaround time. Now for, for research applications where the turnaround time was up to four weeks, batching by far uh, is, the, is the primary contributor to, to turnaround time. So, so this was interesting, but I, I think it's useful to, to take a look at these trends at an application specific level and, and look at the, the turnaround time requirements for each NGS application. So in this slide, I've partitioned a number of NGS applications based on the, the required turnaround time. So at the left, uh, we have the urgent priority applications. And here, every hour counts. Uh, and the, the turnaround time is largely dictated by the, by the time required for sequencing and analysis. So this is a, an example where any technology that can improve or, or increase the speed of sequencing can have a direct positive impact on testing. Now, as one moves to the right, to the high priority uh, applications, uh, batching related delays, but also the time for sequencing uh, are important. And I'll note within this, this uh, subset of applications, there's a potential for, for some gating to, to be related to the availability of the clinician. And then moving further to the right, to the moderate priority activities, this includes things like early cancer screening, but also various research applications. And here, turnaround time is by far the, the greatest contributor, uh, excuse me, batching uh, is by far the, the greatest uh, contributor to turnaround time. And if we look at the, re the research applications themselves, we can, we can understand why. Uh, the, the read requirements for the research applications can vary tremendously. So something, for example, like single cell RNA-seq or Hi-C may require a billion reads per sample, whereas a targeted application like immune repertoire sequencing may require in the millions of reads. So in order to address those batching-related delays, one really needs to have flexible throughput. And then on the far right, the low-priority uh, uh, long-term studies, uh, these studies are, are primarily uh, motivated by the cost of sequencing and, and the accuracy. So, so from this, we, we, we really took home the point that speed is required, uh, especially for the, for the uh, clinical applications, but flexibility uh, in throughput is important for both clinical and research applications. So now I, I wanna switch to describe the sequencing by synthesis process and the ways in which we've been working to improve it to enable rapid SBS. And I, I just want to underscore that uh, as we approached the SBS 
process and, and, and sought to improve it, we, we really took home the, the lessons learned in that uh, first portion of my talk where I, where I uh, discussed the importance of the fast, flexible sequencing. So I, I want to start by giving an overview of the sequencing by synthesis process. And, and actually, what I'm going to describe is uh, optical ensemble sequencing by synthesis using fluorescently labeled reversible terminated nucleotides. This is the most common uh, approach for SBS. It's used by companies like Illumina and, uh, and, and Singular Genomics. And here one starts with input DNA uh, comprising a library. Those uh, input DNA molecules are exposed to a flow cell where they're attached to the flow cell in a process called templating or seeding. After the, the DNA molecules are templated, they, they are then clustered to, to create copies. Uh, and each cluster uh, may consist of hundreds to thousands of copies of those original template molecules. Now, each cluster will end up giving rise to a single sequencing read, and that's why this process is termed ensemble sequencing. In the next step, the sequencing occurs, and this is achieved through the use of fluorescently labeled nucleotides that have been blocked. And those nucleotides are incorporated into complementary strands uh, 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 complementary strands through the uh, use of a polymerase. And because they're blocked, only a single nucleotide will incorporate. Uh, after, after that, uh, a, an image is taken of the flow cell to determine which nucleotide in, uh, incorporated into each cluster. And then, and then finally, there's a cleavage step to uh, remove the linker between the fluorophore and the nucleotide and that blocking YD, and the process may be repeated. And, and th this, uh, this process is referred to as a cycle. And each cycle uh, will reveal one base of the template molecules. And historically, it's been a slow process. Uh, anywhere between five to 10 minutes uh, is typical. But in our hands, owing to a number of uh, innovations, which, which I'll go into uh, discuss in detail, we've been able to get this to under three minutes. And actually, I think that uh, in the near term, uh, as low as 90 second cycles could be possible. Now, following the image acquisition, one needs to convert the images to FASTQ files. Uh, and, then, and then finally, those FASTQ files containing the reads can be interpreted, and that can include things like aligning to the genome, uh, ca uh, calling variants, assessing the, the, um, the, the, the abundance of different RNA transcripts. So with this overview, now I, I want to turn and describe each step in, in greater detail. So starting with the templating and clustering, there are two types of flow cells that one can use uh, at this step. The first is called an unpatterned flow cell. And with, with this approach, uh, the, the, the flow cell uh, enables templating and clustering throughout the flow cell surface. Uh, so that the, the clusters may arise randomly across the flow cell surface. And uh, as a concept, uh, I would say that firstly, that one of the benefits of the unpatterned flow cell is the simplicity. Uh, but uh, the, the drawbacks are owing to that random distribution of clusters. In some cases, the, the, the clusters are too close to one another to enable clear imaging, and that reduces the quality. And then an, another issue overgrown clusters, which are larger than the others and, and, uh, and can also uh, reduce the, the quality and throughput. So, so only to these limitations that the field has, has generally shifted to patterned flow cells shown at the bottom. And here, the templating and seeding is, is, constrained, is constrained to define spots across the flow cell surface. This enables even cluster sizes. And, and further, by controlling the distance between spots, one can precisely tune the throughput of the flow cell. So owing to those advantages, uh, we, we use pattern flow cells in, in the G4. So, so the, the next step is uh, uh, the nucleotide incorporation, the imaging, and the cleavage. And here I have a cartoon of a polymerase with an elongating strand and the template strand, which is bound to the flow cell surface. And you'll note that the, floor, the, the nucleotides are each labeled by a separate fluorophore. So four colors and four nucleotides. 
This is referred to as four-color chemistry. And uh, the use of four-color chemistry facilitates downstream signal interpretation, resulting in higher quality uh, uh, sequencing. And so for that reason, we use four-color chemistry. Another thing I want to point out is the linker between the fluorophore and the nucleotide. So that the linker needs to be stable, but it also needs to enable rapid cleavage following incorporation and imaging. So this, this is very important if, if one is to, uh, to achieve rapid SBS. It's something we worked on a lot. Uh, and uh, it's, it's further important because uh, rapid, um, uh, cl rapid cleavage uh, also ensures that, uh, that dephasing is, is, is minimized. And dephasing refers to uh, a phenomenon where the, the template molecules may become out of sync, and that, re that um, reduces the, the quality of the resulting reads. And now another point uh, that I'd like to mention is, is that even the spacing and the orientation between the nucleotide and the fluorophore can impact performance. And the, the reason is that these modified nucleotides must uh, enter the polymerase uh, active site and be incorporated into the elongating strand. And that can be affected by the 3D structure of the nucleotide. Here's another place where, where we spent a, a, a lot of time uh, identifying a, a great solution. And then uh, likewise with the, with the uh, optimization of the nucleotides, one must also optimize the polymerase itself. And because this, the polymerase is uh, tasked with incorporating uh, unnatural nucleotides, uh, polymerase engineering is required to achieve rapid incorporation with minimal misincorporation. And then the last point I want to mention uh, uh, regards the, the uh, accessibility of the template strand. It must be accessible to the polymerase in order to in, uh, in enable efficient incorporation of the labeled nucleotides, uh, uh, and that results in brighter clusters. And in, in general, there's an inverse relationship between cluster brightness and imaging time. So the brighter the clusters, the shorter the imaging time required. And again, this is another place where uh, um, optimization is needed to get to that under three minute cycle that I mentioned. Great. So now I want to turn to the base calling and the downstream interpretation. Uh, so here the key tasks are to process the images acquired during that, those, that, those sequencing cycles. And that has to occur at the same time that um, the, the sequencing is time processing that must occur rapidly. And after the FASTQ files are generated, then they must also be interpreted. Uh, and that's an alignment, it often involves uh, computationally intensive tasks like alignment and variant detection. And so this is a challenging problem. On, on the slide, uh, at the right side, you can note an image of a pattern flow cell. I just want to convey that these are large images, and uh, in order to do this rapidly, one needs to carefully consider the hardware uh, needed to accelerate these tasks. So in this next slide, I want to describe the, the hardware, the, the main hardware options and what we've decided to go with. So the, the first type of circuit uh, relevant to this task is called an FPGA, or Field Programmable Gate Array. This is a type of configurable uh, integrated circuit which can enable application-specific acceleration. And one of the, the, the big benefits of an FPGA is the low power consumption. So it, it, it's good for things like mobile devices. Uh, and in fact, the FPGA was one of the first approaches to accelerate uh, some bioinformatics tasks. The, the downside to FPGA is that it's very difficult to program. So it, it can take a lot of time to accelerate an arbitrary piece of software. Now, the second type of relevant circuit is a GPU or graphics processing unit. This is a type of circuit that was originally designed to accelerate uh, manipulation of images, but it's since been used for a variety of computing tasks. And what's interesting here is that the GPU uh, processing power has increased tremendously in, re in recent years. It's actually surpassed Moore's law. And you can note that uh, in the graph to the, to the right of this slide. And then the third, the, the third type of, of relevant um, circuit is a central processing unit, CPU. This is a highly versatile uh, uh, circuit. It's the heart of a computer. And although the, the growth in power of CPUs is now less than Moore's law, um, recently multi-core designs have emerged that enable 
multi-threading up to hundreds of threads per, per CPU. And so that greatly enhances the versatility. And so uh, owing to the, the advances in CPU and GPU power, uh, that combination is a very attractive approach for, for uh, uh, this downstream image analysis and interpretation. And in fact, in, uh, in, in our hands, uh, you know, I think a, a 30 minute turnaround time is possible to analyze a whole uh, 30X genome uh, using an integrated GPU CPU solution. And the last point I want to mention about the GPU CPU approach is the availability of those resources in the cloud. They have excellent availability in the cloud, which enables one to, to um, easily uh, uh, transfer an accelerated workflow to the cloud to run at scale. And the last thing uh, I want to mention in this portion of the talk is this uh, is how to achieve flexible throughput. Uh, and there are two main ways that, that one can accomplish this. The, the first is through the use of multiple flow cell types, each having a different uh, uh, read capacity. And the second is through the use of uh, in, enabling multiple flow cells per run. And in the case of the G4 platform, we've taken both approaches. So we have uh, uh, an F2 flow cell producing 150 million reads and an F3 flow cell producing 300 million reads. Uh, in addition to this, the, the G4 includes four flow cell ports, so up to four flow cells may be loaded at runtime. There's an image of the flow cells on the right, and I'll further note that each flow cell contains four fluidically independent lanes to facilitate multiplexing. So, so with this strategy, we can deliver uh, flexible throughput from 150 million reads up to 1.2 billion reads per run. Great. So, so, so now I'd like to, uh, in this last part of the talk, I'd like to discuss the applications of rapid SVS. And, and here I want to highlight data from the, the new Singular Genomics G4 platform. And, and I want to say, uh, at, uh, bef before I show you the data, uh, you know, we approached this, uh, the sequencing in uh, first to deliver faster, more flexible sequencing, but we also wanted to do so without any compromise to sequence quality. And so I hope to convey to you in this section how we've accomplished that. And, and to start, uh, I'd like to show you some RNA-seq data because that's, that's a very common application. And then after that, I'll switch to whole genome sequencing. So here is an uh, overview of a study that we performed uh, using RNA-seq to evaluate the technical reproducibility of the GPO platform. Uh, we prepared a poly-ARNA-seq library using the reference sample UHR with an ERCC spike-in to as assess the accuracy over a, over a wide di dynamic range. And this was uh, performed as part of a larger RNA-seq RNA study that we're, we're going to soon publish. And the sequencing following library preparation, the, the sequencing was performed on two separate G4 instruments using an F2 flow cell and two by 100 base pair uh, reads. And after uh, the, the sequencing, the, uh, the reads were downsampled to, 100, uh, to uh, 25 million reads uh, uh, per sample. And following that, uh, transcripts were quantified using STAR and SALMON. So in the, in the lower left of this slide, uh, I have a, a table uh, highlighting the high-level run metrics. So one can note that the Q30 Percentage Q30 for both read one and read two of the two replicates is about 85%. And then if we turn to the upper right-hand corner of the slide, we have the correlation between observed counts for the ERCC spike-in versus the expected counts. And, and we see a high correlation for both replicate one and replicate two uh, with results that are, that, that are quite similar across the technical replicates. And uh, below, we have a correlation of transcript counts across the two replicates. And here again, a very high correlation, 0 0.995, su suggesting that the platform has excellent technical reproducibility. But, but you know, I, I think an, an, a really interesting question is, is to ask how this data compares to the data uh, produced by a, a more con conventional SBS uh, platform. And so what we did to address that is to take the same uh, input material, UHR with ERCC, and, and submit it for sequencing through a, a third party uh, uh, with the uh, NextSeq 2000. 
And then we took that data and compared it to, to the, the, uh, the, the sequencing performed on the G4. And here are the results of that comparison. So taking a look at the upper, upper left, the correlation of transcript counts between the Illumina and G4 replicate, technical replicate one, uh, we see again a high correlation in transcript counts 0.993. And I'll note that the correlation across platforms is nearly the same as the correlation of technical replicates within platforms. So I think that that speaks to the fact that the data is quite similar across these two platforms. And, and consistent with, with one, what one might expect from this high correlation in transcript counts, we, we also see very similar profiles of gene body coverage uh, uh, below. And then in the middle, the number of detected genes across both uh, data sets. And then uh, the, finally, the distribution of reads across genic and intergenic regions. So, so I think this is encouraging that uh, despite the speed ups in, in the sequencing process, the data quality is, is quite good. Uh, but perhaps uh, a more rigorous examination of uh, of the data quality would, would be one that involves variant detection uh, following whole genome sequencing. So to, to address that, we uh, decided to sequence the, the NA12878 reference cell line uh, using two by 150 base pair reads. And we did this using four F2 flow cells, each of which produce 150 million reads uh, and, and, and thereby produced uh, about 700 million two by 150 base pair reads total. So taking a look at the bottom left, the metrics, four flow cells, uh, the, the percentage uh, Q30 for read one and read two from each of those flow cells. And again, in here, you, you'll see the Q30 scores in the high 80s to low 90s. Now, if we took a, take a look at the upper right hand uh, of, of this slide, we can, we can note the quality score distributions across read one and read two. Uh, very similar quality score distribution, suggesting that there's not a, a, a difference in quality between read one and read two of the paired end reads. Then moving below, uh, the observed versus predicted quality. This, this plot shows how, um, how well calibrated the quality scores are. And we see excellent concordance between the observed and predicted quality. And I think this, this highlights one of the strengths of the platform, that the quality scores are, are quite accurate. Great. Now, now I'd like to touch on uh, alignment and coverage metrics. So reads were aligned to the genome with BWA, and then we assessed the, the, the coverage over high confidence regions of, of the genome. And here you can note uh, the, at the top metrics when using two flow cells uh, or 20x target coverage, three, three flow cells, which is 30x target coverage, and then the entire four flow cell data set, 40x target coverage. And the 40x target coverage achieved uh, a 45x mean coverage uh, uh, over the genome with 99.69% of bases covered at greater than 10x. And then at the bottom left, uh, we have the observed versus theoretical coverage as expected from a, a Poisson process. And we can see here again that, that, there, that there's a great uh, consistency between the two, suggesting that uh, there is even coverage. And then moving to the right, the normalized coverage as a, as a uh, function of the GC content. Uh, and one can note that there's even coverage over a broad range of GC content. There, there is a modest reduction in coverage as one goes to the extremely high uh, GC, but it's, it's not anything uh, out of the ordinary from what has been reported in literature. And then on the right, a circos plot uh, giving the global view of the results. The innermost ring shows the coverage across the chromosomes. And then uh, the middle ring, uh, the GC content. Uh, so, so this is encouraging, uh, but, but I think uh, really that one of the best ways to evaluate the, the data is to assess the accuracy of the reads following alignment. And so th this slide uh, does that very thing. I think it's, a, it's quite an, an important slide. So on the left, uh, we have the accuracy of read one and read two as a function of cycle. And this is showing for each of the four flow cells in the study. Uh, one can note the high accuracy over a broad, uh, uh, over, over, over the entire read, uh, 
moreover, the accuracy uh, profiles for read one and read two look quite similar. And so I think, again, this speaks to the fact that read one and read two uh, with this paired end sequencing approach are, are, are quite similar in quality. And then on the right, we have uh, the error rate uh, broken down by error mode. And, and here one can note that the, error, uh, the errors are, are dominated by substitution sequencing errors with insertion deletion errors uh, uh, quite rare. It's actually hard, hard to see them in the plot. And uh, this, this profile is interesting, I think, because it looks quite similar to what one would expect from an Illumina platform. And, and, and that suggests that the data from this G4 should be compatible with uh, software that is designed for, for Illumina data. Uh, and, and so to address that, that, or to assess that question, uh, we decided to perform germline variant detection using the Google Deep Variant algorithm. Uh, and, and a model that had been trained exclusively using Illumina whole genome sequencing data. So we took that model and we applied it to our data set without further training. And, and this, this slide shows the results. Uh, we have the metrics, uh, the, the, the performance metrics at 20x, 30x, and 40x target coverage. And, and one can note that the, the uh, performance both for SNFs and indels is quite high. Uh, again, without any further training, suggesting that the data is quite interchangeable with, with that from, from, from the Illumina platform. And then the, the last point I want to mention is uh, we, we also evaluated performance over challenging genomic features. This include, included repetitive uh, elements shown at the left, uh, homopolymers uh, uh, in the middle, and then short tandem repeats on the right. And uh, we see excellent performance cr across these different genomic features. Uh, and and, and um, by the way, this, this study follows the, the paradigm uh, uh, used in the ABRF next generation sequencing study. And I, and I just want to mention that you can really tell from the performance on homopolymers uh, and short tandem repeats that this, this data is quite a bit different than what you'd expect from something like semiconductor sequencing where homopolymers are a problem. So with that, uh, uh, I'm going to finish the talk. And to summarize, I, I described how rapid sequencing and flexible throughput are critical to reducing turnaround times for research and clinical applications. Uh, I described to you ways in which we've been working to improve uh, um, sequencing by synthesis to enable rapid SBS. And then I, I hope I've convinced you that you, one can achieve rapid SBS without compromising data quality. And the, the last what I mentioned is that there's going to be uh, more data presented at the upcoming AGPT conference, June 6th through 9th. And I'm leaving you here with an image of the G4 sequencing platform. It's a benchtop sequencer. Uh, so thank you for your time, and I really, looking, I really look forward to taking your questions.